How Insulin Was Discovered – Canada's Gift to the World There are few people more passionate about the work of Sir Frederick Banting than Grant Maltman, the chief curator of Banting House National Historic Site of Canada since 1995. He works tirelessly to share the story of Banting and the discovery of insulin. Thank you for that welcome and for making that bio as painless as possible to listen to. And thank you to the Insulin 100 Committee for the invitation to join today's celebration. If we can't be together in person, I can't think of a better place to present from than the very room where arguably the most important breakthrough in the history of diabetes research and management occurred. The site of Dr. Banting's 2 a.m. revelation, which set in motion a chain of events that changed the course of medical history. I'm afraid I've changed things up a little bit since I first submitted my abstract. I think it would be okay, as what I've put together for you better aligns with the other speakers and the goals of this public celebration. Today, I'm not going to dwell on the story that's been told and retold so much already this year. To say the story of the discovery of insulin is layered and complicated is an understatement. Any attempt to untangle the web of distinct abilities, personalities, failures, and successes in our brief time together simply would not do this story justice. Don't misunderstand me. These are important stories and warrant discussion and further debate. But is this the right forum to do so? Do we really need to overshadow the commemoration of Canada's gift to the world with quick questions of who discovered insulin? Where should the credit be apportioned? Or did the correct people receive the Nobel Prize? I would argue no. In my experience as curator of the birthplace of insulin, the importance of the discovery of insulin has nothing to do with any of these issues. Rather, it's the impact insulin continues to have on people in their daily lives. I thought I could better use my time to share with you the perspective of those for whom it truly matters, someone we can all relate to, a parent, a sibling, or a friend living with diabetes. To do so, I'd like to take you on a journey, a brief look at some of the key moments, the days before insulin, the London and Toronto periods, which I'm sure has some puzzle today, conclude with some examples of insulin's legacy and the importance of place for the global diabetes community. If I can properly meld some scholarly research with some enthusiastic storytelling, you will leave satisfied, hopefully wanting more. For many, the discovery of insulin is looked at from the perspective of a single moment in time. This famous photograph taken on the roof of the medical building at the University of Toronto. Often referred to as Marjorie, it is not. I once saw a copy where Banting wrote on the following on the back, me, Charlie, and some mud on the roof, April, 1922. In actuality, it's dog 408, and the photograph was taken on August, 1921. It supports the traditional narrative, which up until Michael Bliss's definitive discovery of insulin, excluded the contributions of J.B. Collip and J.J.R. McLeod. Like any other story, this image is neither at the beginning nor the end. In fact, we can trace the discovery's origins back to 1552 BCE and the Ebers Papyrus, the world's oldest surviving medical text. This parchment featured on this former East German stamp has come to be accepted as the earliest recording of what could be considered a description of diabetes, or at the very least, the diabetes condition. It's been translated several ways over the years, some suggesting it was a prescription for someone with sweet smelling urine, or a process to eliminate urine, which is too plentiful. Subsequent centuries saw numerous breakthroughs in describing and later diagnosing of what was called the pissing disease, but no effective treatments were offered. By 1920, the accepted treatment was the Allen diet, developed by leading American diabetes specialist, Dr. Frederick Allen. In essence, this treatment was little more than a starvation diet defined by precise daily intakes of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. It also included a period of fasting with hope that the patient could live, quote, sugar, and therefore symptom-free. Despite these efforts, once a patient was put on this diet, life expectancy was generally six months to two years. Imagine, if you will, the emotions parents must have felt when they chose to let their children starve in the hope of a miracle, instead of the alternative, letting them continue normally until they slipped into a coma and died. When this photograph was taken in July of 1922, this child was six years old and weighed 25 pounds. He was given approximately six weeks to live. The discovery of insulin changed his prognosis and leads us to the question, how did we get there? Well, we start in London, Ontario. After failing to secure a position as a house surgeon at Toronto Sick Children's Hospital, on the advice of his mentor, Clarence Starr at the University of Toronto, Banding set his sights here. It seemed an appropriate choice. 
London had a growing population. There are only a couple of orthopedic surgeons. A former classmate was already here in town and who could help him navigate this new, this new reality he found himself. And his fiance lived just outside of town. Yes, she was reason number four. I am just the messenger. Banting purchased this home, which was purpose built in 1900 for a private practitioner and private residence. He opened his practice on July 1st, 1920. His first patient arrived 28 days later. And according to his memoir, it wasn't a real medical problem. It was an illegal, illegal alcohol prescription sale. This was not an open it and they will come scenario. He did everything wrong. He didn't take over a retired doctor's practice. So he started off with zero patients. He couldn't advertise his services. And his hours were pretty limited. One to three in the afternoon and seven to eight in the evening. His total income for July was $6. Not good when he owed $7,800 on this house. Supplement his income. He secured a position as a demonstrator in anatomy and surgery at the Western University Medical School. He would equal his July income after one week. One of the myths that continues to be attributed to the discovery of insulin comes into conflict with what happened next. We've all heard the story of the 14-year-old girl or boy, depending on who's telling the story, who passed away from diabetes and said banting on a course to find a cure for this dreaded disease. In his own words, 20 years after the discovery of insulin, he set up to correct this misconception. This is far from the truth. I never treated a patient until after insulin was worked out. I was never interested in and knew nothing of diabetic diets. The idea from which insulin originated was purely theoretical. In late October, he was asked to prepare a lecture on the subject of the pancreas and its possible relationship with diabetes and carbohydrate metabolism. Reading everything he could, he prepared his lecture on the 30th of October. That evening, when he went to bed, he took to bed with him a surgical journal where he came across a survey article that related to his lecture and, do and dozed off. At 2 a.m., he arose from a restless sleep and put to paper a word hypothesis he believed would lead to a successful treatment for diabetes. It was one of those nights when I was disturbed and could not sleep. I thought about the lecture and about the article. Finally, about two in the morning, after the lecture and the article had been chasing each other through my mind for some time, the idea occurred to me. I got up and wrote down the idea and spent most of the night thinking about it. With facilities lacking in London, he was sought the help of Professor John McLeod at the University of Toronto. McLeod eventually agreed to provide Banting with laboratory space, dogs, and a research assistant, Charles Best to support the experiments. While McLeod saw a value in banding surgical approach, he did not expect the experiments to succeed. Work commenced on May 17th, 1921. On July 30th, dog 410 was given an injection of a crude extract and the blue glucose levels dropped. Success, but then the dog died because of the impurities in that extract. Six months later, on January 23rd, 1922, Dr. James Collup's more purified form of the extract was successfully tested on Leonard Thompson. The death sentence for those suffering from diabetes had been lifted. On October 25th, 1923, six days shy of the third anniversary of his idea, Manting became Canada's first Nobel laureate at age 31 for discovery made at age 29. Upset that Best wasn't recognized, he publicly shared half his prize money with him. McLeod then shared half his prize money with Collip. As Bliss so eloquently put it, there should have been glory enough for all, but it was not to be. Six days after that Nobel announcement, Banting returned to London and spoke to the discovery of insulin and its origins. Canadian and American newspapers then identified his London home as the birthplace of insulin, declaring it to be a shrine to the medical community and encouraged it to be purchased, turned into a museum and given a national plaque. In that great Canadian tradition, it took 86 years to finally get the plaque. It takes a little longer to honor our heroes and events in this country. In fact, it was only recently that the discovery of insulin was recognized as an event of national historic significance by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada. In our story, there's nothing more authentic than this room. Well, it's as close as we can get with the uncovering of the original wallpaper and the original piece of furniture we have, the bed. I can't emphasize enough the importance of this room to our visitors is our spiritual room. It's our crying room. It's our raison d'etre and speaks to the importance of place. I could tell you stories of leading scientists from around the world who have sheepishly asked if they could sit on the bed and have their photograph taken. One scientist laid down on the bed, not with permission, I might add, and told me, now that I've been here, maybe now I can finish Banting's work. 
Well, with the number of people with diabetes in the range of 460 million people today, I was tempted to let him stay and have a nap. There's a young mother whose 10 month old was diagnosed with type one, who came to the museum, sat and cried on the bed for almost 10 minutes, and then stood up, took a deep breath and told me, I'll never shed another tear of this. My child is going to live because of what happened in this room all those years ago. Today, we have better insulin. What we don't have is anything better than insulin, making this room as relevant today as it was all those years ago. There's no better way to illustrate that than through these next images. Dr. Banting, thank you very much for discovering insulin. You saved me and many others. You and best are the best, Christy. Thank you for letting me have insulin. I would have been dead, but you came and saved my life. Thank you very much. You're a very nice person, Justin. Dear Dr. Banting, I've lived with diabetes for 24 years and counting, and I just want to thank you for that. You are my hero. Sincerely, Bridget. I think we can all agree humanity and the human experience were captured in those slides, but honesty, not quite. While the world's words were undeniably true, I can't attribute them to those children. In fact, they're samples from the more than 2,000 letters that have been left for Dr. Banting in this very room over the past 10 years. When our visitors experience this space, they're transported back in time. They're compelled to write to a man who's been dead for more than 80 years and share with him and others their expressions of gratitude for insulin or acknowledge inspiration that allows them to continue their own research. That is the importance of place. Then we have Lindsay from Arlington, Texas, who visited on her 10th anniversary and left this message. Quote, Diabetes is a terrible disease to have, but thank goodness for the genius that invented this life-saving medication so I could live a normal life. Being there opens my eyes to the fact that just one idea can get us closer to a cure and change millions of lives. This tour was truly life-changing. Her mother also commented, is a very emotional experience when the significance of his discovery is on the tour beside me, my Lindsay. This was the purpose of our trip to Canada. Tyler got to go on a road trip from Virginia. From an interview with his mother, we give Tyler a small gift every year for his anniversary. so my husband and I decided to buy him a brick this year and make the pilgrimage to the Banding House. We are grateful and we are humbled by the experience of seeing the location where his inspiration for research began. Tyler thanked us and said it was very cool. It is a memory you will not soon forget. And memories are what make places important. Places don't establish themselves as significant. Rather, it's the people who place this significance that seems to last lifetimes. I took this picture of this little girl in the middle about 10 years ago. She just finished a tour of the museum with her family. And after the tour, she went directly to the statue. She knew this man and his colleagues saved her sister's life. She just stood there gazing at him. It's one of my favorite memories of my time here. At Banting House, we also have a responsibility for the future. And for us, that future is represented through the flame of hope, kindled by the Queen Mother in 1989. As a symbol to the lives lost to diabetes and the hope for a cure, it will burn until a cure for diabetes is found. It will be extinguished by the research team, possibly from the University of Toronto, that announces that discovery to the world. Next to the bed, the flame is probably our most photographed object in our collection. Now, to tie it all together, this is Ted Ryder. He was Dr. Banting's last surviving original patient. As a child, he looked just as bad and later, just as good as the children we saw earlier. In fact, he was the first child I showed you, the one in the sailor suit sitting in the wheelchair in 1922. He was almost 77 years old when he died in 1993. His 1923 letter to Banting is one of my favorites. Dear Dr. Banting, I'm a fat boy now and I feel fine. I can even climb a tree. While he never saw a cure, he benefited from broad-based research that wasn't a cure. The discovery of insulin, better insulin, and improvements in the understanding, treatment, and management of his diabetes. He represents a legacy of research conducted before and after the discovery of insulin. Symbols are important. They reflect who we are and what we stand for, and their power to motivate cannot be underestimated. For the researchers of today, Banding House, Sir Frederick Statue, and the Flame of Hope are three such symbols of Canadian ingenuity and hope. For the global diabetes community, Banding House has become a site of pilgrimage, inspiration, and comfort. As we reflect on 100 years of insulin, it's important that we properly acknowledge the important contributions of Banting, Best, Kolb, and McLeod, 
and commemorate the incredible events that occurred at the University of Toronto. It's also important to recognize that the equivalent of a modern day middle of the night post-it note led to the discovery and purification of insulin. For millions of people living with diabetes today, that is all that really matters. Thank you. Now today, I have the honor of unveiling Canada Post's newest stamp, which marks the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin, what we've described as Canada's gift to the world. Canada Post marked the 50th anniversary of the discovery of insulin in March, 1971. Then in 1991, and again in 2000, it issued stamps honoring Sir Frederick Banting and his Nobel Prize winning achievement. Yet there's another aspect of the story that has not been told until now, it is what I've been speaking about for the last 15 minutes. The groundbreaking discovery put Canada, Canadian researchers, and the University of Toronto's medical school firmly on the world stage. The stamp acknowledges the entire University of Toronto research team behind the discovery of insulin. Banting, Charles Best, James Collip, and John McLeod. Their early research inspired medical researchers and practitioners in Canada and around the world. It's a legacy that lives on. Since that eureka moment in 1921, Canadians have contributed to a long list of critical medical advancements in stem cell research, open heart surgery, genetics, and disease. Even as I speak, 100 years after the discovery, researchers at the University of Toronto's Banting Institute are studying progressive treatments in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. It is now my great honor to unveil the stamp. The stamp features the image of an early insulin vial resting on a page from Dr. Banting's notebook, where he reflects back on the very moment he conceived the idea in London and set in motion the events that led to the discovery of insulin in Toronto 100 years ago. The stamp goes on sale tomorrow and it can be purchased at select post offices or at canadapost.ca. Hello, I'm Sonia Sidhu, the Member of Parliament from Brampton South and Chair of the All Party Diabetes Caucus. Canada has a remarkable legacy of leading discoveries in fighting diabetes. In 1923, Dr. Frederick Banting and Dr. John McLeod were awarded the Nobel Prize for one of Canada's most significant contribution to diabetes research, the discovery of insulin. This invention is now considered to be among the most important medical findings of the past century with the research teams around the country working hard to find the cure. As someone who has worked for almost two decades as a healthcare professional with many years dedicated to diabetes advocacy, I know that there's a lot more for us to do when it comes to defeating diabetes. This is why I introduced Bill C-237, which calls on the Minister of Health to work with the provinces and territories to create and implement a national strategy for diabetes one that coordinates funding for awareness, prevention, education, data collection, treatment, and research that will improve health outcomes for all Canadians and one day lead to a cure. It would enhance coordinated efforts with federal, provincial, territorial, and indigenous partners and provide a mechanism for a national framework. I'm very happy that Canada Post, the Government of Canada and Canadians have chosen to commemorate the centennial of the discovery insulin by Sir Frederick Banty and his team. With this stamp, a discovery which went on to change and even save millions of lives around the world. Thank you to all partners, Diabetes Canada, JDRF, Diabetes Action, University of Toronto and others. Today is a reminder of our history. 100 years ago, Canada gave insulin to the world. Why cannot we lead the way in finding a cure? Thank you. And we have now a few minutes uh, for some questions for Grant to answer. So I'm gonna choose from the many in the question box. Uh, Grant, is there one story that stands out for you that you find most incredible about the discovery of insulin? Oh gosh, uh, there have been so many. Um, I'm really lucky that uh, the people I get to meet from around the world who come here and to spend time in this place, uh, 
you don't use the word pilgrimage lightly, but that's what this this place has become and, and this very room. Uh, on an entertaining side, I, I guess it's it's the researcher who's trying to look at our historic wallpaper and, and one side of the room is really bright and you can see it and the other side of the room it's dark and it's very difficult to see uh, and it's blocked by the bed and almost, uh, and this researcher knows in a museum you're not supposed to touch anything and he accidentally leans against it so that uh, he could be touching Banting's bed and, and then when you tell him well it's not the mattress it's the frame it's just a quick grab and can I get a photo so so that's the one extreme I think the other is the collective stories that we hear from people I shared these Dear Dr. Banting letters and as a public historian it really doesn't get any better these letters uh, people who are unprompted uh, sharing their own stories you know Dear Dr. Banting uh, I've been using insulin for 25 years. I just want to let you know I'm alive and well. Stories like that, this this, uh, this, this sense of place and comfort that this building, this room gives for people is probably, is probably the, the memory that sticks, sticks most with me. Can you suggest anything for people who can't get to Banting House? Um, you know, partially now we have COVID and we're in lockdown, but um, are there some resources or other ways that they can find out more about the house? Well, great. You know, um, everything's going to sound self-serving, so I'll say me first. Uh, if you go to the bandinghousenhs.ca is our website. There's a lot of information there, and we are starting to, we have a, a Dear Dr. Banting exhibit. Uh, after this event, we'll be doing one on the history of stamps. Uh, our friends, Defining Moments uh, Canada, uh, has a wonderful set of resources, a three-year program commemorating um, the discovery of insulin and a good colleague and good friend Christopher Ruddy has done this wonderful series of essays on the discovery of insulin, uh, which is great. And uh, the University of Toronto, the Fisher Rare Book Library, has a digital collection and you can see uh, some more of these letters, the equipment is used, and really get to delve deep, uh, as, as deep as you want to go into this uh, extremely uh, interesting and, and layered Canadian story. And one final question for you. So you have studied the man, uh, Banting, quite a bit. Um, we, we, some of us know he was also quite an artist. Can you comment um, on, on the kind of art that he did or his associations historically? Canadians need to know a little bit more about their heroes. Sure. Well, the really fun part that I, I really enjoy speaking about is, is the art. And it, it was a hobby he started here in London. That one patient, 28 days, gives you a lot of free time. But much like setting up his practice here in London, his art career got off to a bad start. He's walking on. Uh, Street, sees a painting in a window and says, I can do one just as well. And he walks in, buys watercolor brushes, oil paints, and tries to draw pictures for magazines. And he has such so few dollars uh, extra to spend. Um, he actually paints on, on the laundromat uh, where his clothes came back around. And we actually have one of those from that 1920s period. By the mid-20s, he becomes good friends with members of the group of seven. First, Lauren Harris. Uh, and then later on, it's Harris who encouraged them to meet A.Y. Jackson and a wonderful friendship. Almost 13 years they're painting together. Um, his early stuff isn't that good. Uh, then again, I can't draw stick people well, so I can't be overly critical. But his later works are, are fantastic. The Canadian landscape. Uh, Jackson said he moved from the mere amateur to an accomplished painter. And it would have been incredible what he could have done. Uh, had he not died in 1941 and retired at the age of 50 and devoted the rest of his life his to art, which was his intent. And this is going to end the first sec first Q&A that we have. And we're going to move on to our next session, starting off with some stories about living with diabetes by Mike and Sasha. <laughs>